welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of Takshashila Institution's All Things Policy. Delighted to have you all with us today. And I also want to introduce guest speaker today is Harshit. Hi, Harshit. How are you doing? Hi, Carl. What's up? Oh, I'm very good. In Bangalore, it's a fairly chilly weather today. What about you? Delhi, it's more chilly. And I think I like the cold. I like the Delhi cold more than the Bangalore one. Oh yeah, 100%. <laughs> but you know, uh, do you think this could be because of climate change and change in weather patterns? Because that's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's episode, right? Yeah, so we have been seeing a lot of, for instance, there was a heat wave in Europe and mm. there have been some extreme weather sort of conditions or disaster in the Indian subcontinent also. Mm. So yeah, this is happening because of climate change and so climate change also, there is natural climate change which happens oh. over thousands of years and there is sort of anthropological man-made climate change. So all of this is happening because of the anthropological rapidly changing sort of planet-wide warming. Mm. Yeah, and I think there was a reference to how, you know, the global temperature is rising year on year. And, you know, if we don't, you know, sort of bring the level of you know, control over our carbon emissions, we are likely to see temperature rise by about 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 and, you know, 3 to 4 degrees Celsius by, you know, 2100. So I think it's a very pressing concern. But I think in this episode, we are not going to be talking about usual approaches to tackling climate change. Harshit is working on a project at Takshashila, which is to do with how do you adopt biological reasoning and biological approaches to solve public policy problems, right? And today's public policy problem that we'll talk about is climate change. So, Harshit, can you give us maybe a background to why you decided to work on this topic and, you know, what was ailing, what were the existing uh, sort of approaches that you felt needed, you know, to be supplemented? So, public policy, the main frameworks we have used are economic reasoning. So, demand and supply, prices, markets. So, they have been able to solve a lot of our problems, but there exists a gap between what we plan and what we intend to achieve and what we are able to achieve. So we thought that we can look at sort of insights from evolutionary biology, cognitive sciences, psychology, neuroscience, and maybe get relevant insights from them so that we can apply them for to increase our understanding of society, of culture of public government interactions and other things. So we call this biological reasoning. So biological Mm -hmm. reasoning is meant to supplement economic reasoning in public policy. So in this climate change case, I think this would be highly relevant because we have the technical know-how and economic reasoning has been playing quite well. For instance, the price of renewables like solar, newly installed renewables in a lot of parts of the world are now cheaper than coal, and petroleum. So obviously the prices vary a little and they go up and down. But eventually the trend has been that renewables are now much cheaper. And still we are not putting up renewable sources. Still we are not doing the green transition that we should be doing because there's a disaster looming. And even though when we are able to see the consequences, we are not moving in that direction. Got it. So you spoke about like, you know, why you wanted to sort of, you know, supplement these approaches. But, you know, why do you think that, you know, with a disaster looming and, you know, there are other consequences to climate change for humans, including, you know, extreme weather conditions, as we mentioned earlier in the episode. And this could be in the form of, you know, droughts, floods, you know, agricultural sort of, you know, disturbances, mass migration due to rising sea level. So, you know, with these disastrous consequences looming, you know, on the horizon, why do you think that we need to, you know, sort of tackle this crisis, you know, sort of on an immediate basis? Yeah, so I think your question, you're just trying to understand why we are not able to do it, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so a lot of my thinking has been shaped by a very nice paper 
on climate change and biology and well, basically society cooperation. So I'll put the link in the description. But it's a paper in the annual review of psychology. I think it was released in 2021. It talks about uh, climate change, COVID-19 and misinformation. But the climate change part has really shaped my sort of insights in this. And it is a very nice read. Mm. So, yeah. So climate change, if you look at it, people assume that it is only a short term versus a long term thing. For instance, you don't want to give up your short term comforts or your short term benefits for your long term interest. So that is there, but you cannot reduce it only to that. There's also what the paper very nicely introduces as abstractness. Mm. So there's also an abstractness to this particular problem. Okay. And what do you mean by abstractness here, Harshil? If you can just throw some light on it. Yeah. So what they have done is, and what I think is a very nice way to put it, is that they have said that abstractness is a distance from certain things. That, Mm. for instance, they say that it is very abstract and it is very far from you and from the consequences and the effects are Mm. relatively far, the consequences of climate change. So they put these on three sources of distance. It is like distance in time, distance from self, and distance from your in-group. So distance from times means that climate change. And even though we are we have been facing certain events, maybe in a decade or so, our agriculture patterns would be similarly affected and a lot of things. But the disastrous consequences of climate change are still a decade or two down the line. Or maybe catastrophic changes are still three or four decades down the line. Mm. So they were distinct in time. For instance, you don't want to give up uh, oh. maybe your car right now so that four decades after this, after today's date, your children can live in a better future or the next generation can live in a better future. Hmm. So there's always a distance in time. So, yeah, because of this, you're not able to make that uh, sort of that reward, that cost reward analysis and your know, cost benefit analysis and sure. you're not able to sort of make a what we think is a very rational decision then mm-hmm. there's distance from self for instance moving from the level of the individual to the level of your next kin or maybe your family then to maybe your caste your tribe then to the state then to the country and then maybe to the world is quite yeah. difficult So uh, you are less likely to do certain things which you think will be helpful or will be in the long run will be beneficial to the whole world. So you Mm. may or may not be willing to do all those things. And there is also the thing about groups. So you are more like if you think that maybe giving up, for instance, eggs, Okay, we assume eggs for the lack of a better example. Eggs have a larger carbon footprint. Maybe then there's a substitute about which comes. Those are lab-grown eggs. So, Mm. but the lab-grown eggs, even though they provide the same nutrients, they are more costlier. So if you want Mm. everybody in your community to eat those lab-grown eggs and those are very carbon-friendly, you have to make your people from the community spend a little more which they would have been spending somewhere else or maybe eat little less eggs or and then they are not able to get all the calories and protein they need. Mm. So this is distance, there is time and there is in-group. So mm. this all leads to an abstractness to the climate change problem or narrative. Mm. Got it. So just to kind of, you know, dig a little deeper uh, on this point. So you you talked about how an issue like climate change with its collective action problem has very uncertain outcomes, you know, uh, in the future. Individuals are not motivated to take immediate action, right? Because they would rather, let's say, take instant gratification over, you know, trying to, you know, have a delayed gratification, for instance. So how do you think like, and you know, I don't know whether it's relevant uh, to this uh, discussion, but, you know, maybe as individuals, how do you think we should approach 
tackling an issue like climate change and if you could maybe then talk about uh, how do we as groups and then how do we at a national level you know sort of tackle these problems so as individuals climate change even if you look at climate change as such climate change is a problem of if you like tore it down to very simple language if you like tore it down to very simple language is the problem of cooperation so at an individual level maybe you can take certain actions which help you cut down your carbon emissions and maybe help others cut down their emissions but individually i don't think even though there is a lot of narrative around how you can maybe give up meat it will help save tons of carbon emissions from you you cannot make a very large dent but when mm. you go a level up to the level of society or to the level of country if you increase this cooperation you can sort of reduce your carbon emissions help mm. in climate mitigation help in reduction of all those other harmful things you are doing which are sort of leading to a lot more emission and causing the future generations to be in a very dicey place and to be exposed to a lot of risk so mm. if you want to change society there are certain measures you can sort of change or maybe as government as the civil society organizations and other people this is what i think is a good approach to think about this so first you have to increase proximity to the other people all around the world so you have to reduce that distance so even for instance maybe we say that madagascar will have a lot of consequences because of climate change it will see a lot of leave madagascar let us talk about bangladesh so bangladesh we assume that maybe 10 years down the line if emissions continue like this global emissions continue like this there will be a lot of flooding a lot of the states the country's area will be under water will be unlivable so bangladesh even though they are our neighbors and even though india will face a lot of consequences mm. because of that because there will be a lot of people who now want to migrate to india and who want to come to india to work and bangladesh would need our support we are the only land mm. neighbor so mm. you have to reduce that distance between us and the people of bangladesh so okay. this you can do maybe through very simple things like cultural exchange maybe you portray them in our mass media positive portrayal mm. and we also need to emphasize on the connections that we and the bangladeshis have mm. basically you should empathize with everybody but you cannot do that you, you will not be able to do that so at this stage you can empathize with them and maybe then we'll be able to take better climate mitigation sort of measures and reduce our carbon emissions hmm okay so if i hear you correctly it's about disseminating information and reducing that proximity between peoples right yeah increasing the proximity reducing the distance okay got it increasing the proximity sure So Harshit before we move forward on this discussion you know maybe we'll take a short break and we'll come back soon Hello and we are back after that break we are discussing biological approaches to solving climate change problems Harshit was talking about a few solutions that he has in mind here Harshit do you want to elaborate on a few more Yeah so i think the second there's no particular order of importance the second thing is we can use kinship to our advantage so you can emphasize that the young and vulnerable maybe your children your gan- grandchildren will have to deal with whatever futures we are creating now so this would help reducing that distance in time so now because of that kinship connection you are invested in the future and mm. maybe for instance you can also increase children's awareness of climate change so now they can go home and question their elders and grandparents and maybe they it will get them thinking and now they are more invested in this and now they take measures to tackle this because this is not a problem which will take place now this is a problem which will take place in decades so mm. yeah so i think that is a good way and 
in that way you can make the person who is currently in charge in power more invested in the future because now there's a kin connection so oh, okay. that seems like a pretty smart way and the third way but that's like you know that's like saying sorry to cut you there but isn't this like saying that you know uh, your future generations will be affected so you know you need to do something about it yeah is, but is that so only the uh, signaling or only the messaging in which you say your future generations and if you don't improve hmm. the kinship connection i don't think you will be able to get very anywhere yeah. Mm. sort of very far yeah i think mm. there is a need to invoke kinship in this and i would prefer that if there is messaging or signaling like this it would invoke immediate kins not distant kins somewhere so children mm. grandchildren so that way so that the people right now in power are more likely to invest in climate change climate mitigation and as it so that it seems like a good mm. idea another approach is that you have to emphasize that how sort of these non climate friendly things or whatever we do have a harmful effect on other people and also on other organisms that are living in the world so you have to invoke empathy and some sort of but for this you have to highlight concrete harms for instance you say that because of rising temperature the sundarbans will most likely die away in 10 years so because of the mm-hmm. rising sea level and the climate change sundarbans will most likely die so you have invoked a concrete form of harm to a particular mm-hmm. subset of nature and then you try to invoke some kind of empathy in the person to whom the message is relayed so you are just trying mm. to invoke that sympathy and uh, empathy and get some sort of change in his habits and whatever he is doing so to make it more climate friendly got it yeah and uh, one more interesting approach i read was so there is conflicting research on this so some people say that sort of in group cooperation that is the group bias we talk about at mm. a smaller level is detrimental to cooperation at a global level so because if you are in a tribe of maybe 10000 people somewhere in rural india and for instance making sort of not taking your cattle for herding will lead to a huge decrease in your livelihood but will be very good for the local environment and eventually the global sort of environment and everything else so you are hmm. logically you are less likely to do that because you don't want to inflict huge cost on your local group but so a lot of research has emphasized is that you have to break this the local group bonding and take them to the global stage for instance you have to take them yeah. to the stage up maybe up maybe to the state level then to the national level and then to a global level but there is also hmm. research which i think i agree with more so hmm. that if you if smaller local cooperative groups are more sort of friendly to climate and are more friendly to an, any sort of like social problem that mm. uh, all those groups even when they are doing different things they can collaborate they can within their groups lead to huge reduction in our climate emissions so oh. local groups can manage local problems sustainably and so overall the global so even if you don't have a global sort of mechanism for managing mm. all of this you will be able to get good results and a good reduction in climate sorry in climate change mm. and in our emissions so all of these seem um, i think this is a pretty good summary of thought this yeah. on climate changes from a biological reasoning viewpoint very interesting very interesting so i think like just to summarize you advocate for framing the problem in a different way right frame it as an in group based you know sort of a problem rather than looking at it through an abstract notion of a national level climate change action or a international global level climate change action yeah so instead of this being a global catastrophe make it a local mm. catastrophe and make sure that people understand that this will affect other groups they empathize with and their future generations so you bring the problem closer to home and closer in time hmm 
So anything that the government can do in this regard, Harshit, like if you can think of something, like are there campaigns that the government can run? Are there specific people they can tap into, you know, that can probably highlight these problems? Because I think the problem with climate change is also that not many people even take it seriously, right? So you have a problem of, you know, very less appetite for solving this problem. And then on the other hand, how do you go about solving that problem? Like once you've identified that the problem exists. So yeah, if if you have some ideas in mind or, you know, if people can maybe look up something on this, that would be nice. Yeah. So uh, this is one of my favorite examples, which I used to give mm-hmm. is, so this is learning biases we are talking about. So Amitabh Bachchan, okay. as the ambassador for polio vaccination, was a hit. And it, hmm. I don't know what exactly you can attribute to him. But a lot of people identified Amitabh Bachchan with the polio drops and that led to, I think, a lot of people taking their kids for polio drops. So you can have Mm. brand ambassadors to which people identify. The messaging has to change. And the messaging has to bring it closer to home and closer Mm. in time. And obviously you have to take into account all the other things. The technologies cannot be very costly. Mm. So even, for instance, the technologies now are much cheaper. But people don't think this is a problem which they face or their future generations will eventually have to face at a large scale. So government, except all the sort of the normal rational public policy things you can do, you can take mitigation measures, you can make technology available, Mm -hmm. maybe carbon credits, everything else. Two or three things are which we can sort of do which the government can do right now first of all is the signaling the messaging the messaging should be from an authority that people look up to so the same Amitabh Bachchan polio example the messaging should bring it closer to home and closer in time and we are doing an event on 16th Feb mostly it would be an in-office in-person event at our office in Church Street where we'll discuss sort of climate change through biology and policy viewpoint I think we can get more insights and more clearer framing of our problems after that discussion. So that's great. So are you also inviting participation from people to sort of present their maybe solutions or, you know, some ideas on how to go about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this would be a conference and which we encourage. This is highly encouraged that you bring your own ideas. That maybe, for Mm. instance, climate change is a huge, complex problem to solve. Maybe your idea can help us frame it better from a biology and policy, a biological reasoning viewpoint. Or maybe you have some part, you're trying to solve some part of the problem. So we don't want, I don't think it is possible that we can come up with a one size fits all solution. I would be quite happy and satisfied if we are able to frame certain parts better, get certain solutions which affect a lot of these things. Very interesting. So yeah, we'll probably share more details in the coming weeks of this particular, uh, you know, meeting that Harshit has planned. But yeah, I think let's wrap up the discussion then, Harshit. Thanks a lot for enlightening us on this topic. And uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. Yeah, yeah. Carl, one more thing before we go. So there's a biology and policy society. It's a learned society that we run. I'll put up the link in the description. You can put it up for signing up. So the event is under the Biology and Policy Society ages. So if you want regular updates and if you want everything else from this, please consider joining that and please send in your applications. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for having me. And it was a very nice, interesting discussion. Hey, no worries. Thanks, thanks, Harshil. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website, takshashila.org.in.